Good. So I had to get a cup of coffee. Takes me a while. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Now, can you hear me? I don't have my microphone with me. I'm speaking just directly through my computer. So. Yeah. No. Here. Yeah, it sounds great. Okay. Sounds re really good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. There's a whole lot of things going on in this world right now. Oh, there sure are, but uh, I'm going to honestly say, <sighs> are you there? No, I'm here. Okay. I, I yeah. Some of those questions. Uh, let me let me go to your original question sheet. So, um, let's see. All right, so I, uh, so Jesse asks about the uh, bond ETFs. And, if, and I would say because money is fungible, yes, it's by definition means that the money is going to go searching other places if the Fed is buying them and, of course, paying uh, or, or creating their own market valuations. So the money, so that that sells it to it has to go seek out uh, other alternatives. So, yes, and I'm willing to wager that the Fed begins mass, massive, I'll stress that word, massive amounts of muni buying very soon because the revenue shortfalls in uh, state, uh, county, and municipal governments is going to be vast. And to prevent those rates from those bond yields rising and really creating a, a very bad feedback loop, you are going to see them, meaning the Fed, really ramp up uh, the muni purchases, which has already been approved by the uh, treasury and they'll be able to do it. So, you know, you can watch the muni uh, ETFs. I don't know any of them. I don't trade them. If I buy munis, I, I seek out, uh, I don't want the shit with the good stuff. So uh, yes, it'll get me less yield, but not really concerned about that at this time. Well, it's a concern, um, concerned with the return on capital, not the return of capital. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. You know what? If I, you know, you can buy some leverage when you guys will do the homework on that. Me, um, I hope that, uh, let's see. I, yeah, Jesse, a lot of programs are going to pretend to end. I don't see them ending until they have a better handle on what the duration of this is going to be. Okay, let's go down to Southern Italy. Um, uh, Michael, uh, my, I, let's see if it's Southern Italy and he's out walking the, the hills with, uh, with some shotguns. I'm thinking this is Michael Corleone's uh, grandson. Uh, just kidding. Um, you know, there's already some talk today about the Italians uh, not getting enough out of this. I'm not even going to entertain that because right now it's all going their way. And I know that um, it, it was in a column by uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard that uh, Pebble sent me to, because we always go, go through them. And I, and I disagree with Ambrose Evans Pritchard's view that the Italians are going to have a crisis come September because the amount of, uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, we got you. Absolutely. Okay. I'm on the hotel internet, so there's nothing I can do. No, you're good. So I'm, I'm not in that camp. I think right now, Europe, and the, and the fact that the Euro is doing what it's doing. And now some people are going, well, the Euro's rallying too high, Lagarde will be upset. I'm going to take the, the opposite side of that and go, Lagarde will be happy with the rally in the euro to a certain level. 
because number one, it makes the Germans happy. Germans are not opposed to it because again, in a contextual basis, this is not an overly strong Euro. And number two for Lagarde, it shows that she's on the right track because they're not trashing the Euro and downplaying it. So for those who are looking for an alternative to the dollar, the Euro has now because of its, you know, as I maintained, the existential threat to the Euro as of last Tuesday morning, and I would go back to May 24th, of course, with Schweibel, but the existential risk has dropped from 40% to 10%. And I have to assign it some level, so I'll say 10%. And that's why you're seeing people now going, oh, okay, I'll, I'll buy the Euro here. At least it gives me some diversification from the dollar. So uh, does that, Michael, are you happy with that? <clears throat> Michael, can you talk? Michael was Michael's um, uh, our German, one of our oh. Germans. Oh, but who's he's down that, in southern Italy. Yeah, who's got a house in Bari, Italy? So he's spending some time out, out on the ocean. Hey, yeah, Michael. can you can you hear me, Michael? I can hear you. Bari, Italy is very dear to my heart because my father was stationed uh, in Bari when he was bombing the uh, Romanian oil fields. So, oh, great! Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm forty minutes from uh, Bari. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great information. Thank you. Okay. I, yeah, you know, I, I just don't see it. You know what? Merkel, you know, and I'm not a fan of Merkel, but she, she got the message on this one and they got everything that they wanted. Uh, you know, they knew that that 500 billion, that was going to be negotiated downward anyway in order to placate the frugal four. But they, the frugal four really had no power here. Because if the Germans said, hey, we're gonna, you, know, you know as well as I do, if they say, no, we're not going to bankroll this, then they're all in hot water. So, you know, everybody got a little something, which is always a good political negotiation. If everybody feels like they got something, that is a very successful uh, outcome. So, and I'm not looking for anything yet at this point. Let, let's see the way this starts to really evolve. Uh, we'll go to Adam. Uh, of course, the income gap is growing, uh, but that's all part of going back to Bernanke's portfolio balance channel, in which those who can be, who have the most ability to take the most risk are getting rewarded in the short term because, look at companies are not really, you know, there's, there's companies declaring bankrupt, bankruptcy, I should say, but minimal effects. And the Fed is busy buying so many or potentially buying so many bonds that you know people are not really getting hurt. And therefore, if you if you take that road and you have cash to take on or you have money or liquid assets to be able to uh, partake in the uh, equity market rally, which is by default the only investable uh, area, because even if you're real estate, I, I know a lot of people in real estate who are nervous enough now that they're not buying, they're just wondering how this is gonna, when it's gonna end and how it's gonna end. And are they gonna be able to to, um, uh, to crawl back any of the uh, money that they've basically been in forbearance for rents? So a lot of uh, uncertainty and that leaves the equity market. So if you're liquid enough and have that type of uh, power, by definition, the income gap is going to grow because all you do is have to look at the recent studies that came out of Harvard. I believe it was the Harvard. Yeah, it was Harvard. Uh, as far as the uh, lower percentile of the income, you know, they're spending all their money. And in fact, because they're getting more than they were making working, they're sp actually spending more. And the middle part is, the middle to upper is saving, but that leaves the the people at the top with the most flexibility to partake in this. Yeah, and I know about Robin Hood and you know what? I'm sure they're doing well and, that, and that's good because they're supplementing whatever assets they have, but it's the people who have the most investable income and those are the people at the top. So as long as the market keeps going up, that gap is gonna widen. 
Ira, we'll, we'll, um, uh, assuming that there's going to be uh, a three or four trillion dollar or maybe more or less, whatever, uh, infrastructure bill, well, one to three trillion, right? Um, infrastructure bill. Uh, well, well, wait a minute. We know it's bigger than one and it's not quite going to be as it's not going to be as big as the three and a half trillion passed by Congress. The Senate will, but let's let's say that for the sake of compromise, it gets to about how about two point seven? Okay, perfect. Yes, all right, that's great. How far? How far will that? Uh, uh, how far? Of, how far do you figure that that's going to go in helping to to um, to reestablish the the. Uh, uh, how, how to say this the right way? The, well, to reestablish the U.S. workforce on solid footing. Uh, uh, yeah, I I don't know. I I, I don't know. Um, I have to see what what the real um, what's really in there. If it's just sending paychecks to people, then you're just it's yeah. trash. But if you are really going to embark upon you know and i know i i know everybody's timelines you know I've, I've argued them i've argued with plenty of people but the fact of the matter is i just drove from uh chicago to new york it's all construction i took 80 the whole way um lots of construction and you know what where i used to again go oh what did i do you know now i'm happy yeah because you know the, the resurface and this is really nothing you see bridge Bridge building. How long is that project at um, in Chicago on ninety? You know, downtown. It's been three years since that bridge has been out. Right. Oh, easy. easy. You no. Know. Well, but now I can't bemoan it because the more jobs, the better for the economy. And it's not like you're creating. You've already created the spending power, so now get something for it. That's that's my point. You know, and on these infrastructure. You know, you can I. I've just driven 2,800 miles in this country. And, you know, and you get to see a lot uh, through all parts. And the amount of stuff that just needs to be done via highways. You know, I'm not into airports and, and ports. And uh, let's talk about the importance of building out the, um, the electric grid and make it uh, safer from uh, cyber attack. Yeah, there's all kinds of things to be done. I understand the short end when they just wanted to push money in to stabilize the system and stabilize demand. I, I get that. But in this one, there better be some, some real stuff. And, and that's where you have to give it to Europe because Lagarde was really clever. She is an owl, not a hawk, not a dove. And she, she got a lot of green infrastructure. And who can argue with green infrastructure? Hell, you'll have, uh, what's her name? Uh, Greta on your doorstep, you know. Um, so they, they were very clever. Let's see what's involved in this by the time it uh, makes it to the uh, president's desk to be signed. Uh, so, so we don't know. And then I'll take the last one from Jeff on China. Uh, I mean, the last one that's here, we'll get into some more. I don't know. I don't know what's going to be the outcome from Hong Kong. You know, I'm not a believer that Hong Kong is is that important an issue? But, you know, I, I always believe that Taiwan is of much greater concern from the global macro perspective. Uh, the United States is playing this up now, but there should be no surprise to anybody because if you go back four months, five months, Steve Bannon, who I believe is uh, Donald Trump's Jiminy Cricket, <laughs> was telling you that this election was going to be China, 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 China. So uh, is this one of those situations like with Obama? Uh, you broke up a little. <clears throat> I mean, Putin talked this once the election over, you know, we'll get down to it. I'm telling Putin, Mike, that this is election stuff and they had to be tough on Russia. But after the election, uh, the negotiations would be far different. So that takes care of the pointed questions. What else do you have? Let me ask you about, since you just mentioned the election, uh, um, do you think that the, uh, that the, that the, the markets, 
I think I already know the answer to it, but do you think that you, that the equity markets are, are equity markets, let's just stick with that, are shrugging off the polls or they don't believe the polls or is it just there's so much money propping up the, 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 the band-aid is so large propping up the equity markets that we're seeing the destruction of the dollar? You know what, Pax, I can't answer that because when people tell me about the polls and I, and I try to avoid political discussions because they're not for, they're for argument purposes and they're not for um, dialogue. Everything is personal. So I, I don't have them, but I do, do remind people that the same polls were showing Hillary trouncing uh, uh, Trump. So I, I said, you know, I look at them with a grain of salt. And I said, as you should, because if you're really a, a Biden or Democrat supporter, you should not become complacent. This, don't turn this into Hyman Minsky and become complacent. I think that's what the Democratic Party itself is afraid of, that if these polls, and you know, I've heard from some Democratic uh, you know, people who, who are not insignificant, who are concerned that some of this is just Republicans you know, trying to keep um, participation softer by doing this. I don't know. So that tells you everywhere where we are. Where our, uh, I have no, really, I don't have a definitive answer. I say right. I Yeah, no, and I know you do, and I, I, I try to too, but I guess the, the, the thought that I had was that uh, in, in the primary when we were talking about, um, uh, we were talking about Lizzie, Lizzie War, uh, Warren and, um, uh, and Biden going head to head and, uh, the market didn't like the, the market didn't seem to like either one of them uh, at that time, and so I was thinking that uh, with with Biden leading in the polls, that the market wouldn't like Biden, you know, leading in the polls. Maybe they don't believe it, or maybe it's just shrugging it off, not making a political statement whatsoever, but just looking at the uh, going back to that conversation that we had during the, the during the primaries. I, um, and again, I, I don't know. You know, yeah. I, I don't I don't know. Um, when you drive as much as I drove in certain parts, you still see predominantly Trump. Now driving through Ohio, and I pay attention, and it's all anecdotal, see it's a lot more Biden bumper stickers. And I drove the same road in 2016. And when I, in October of 2016, and my wife and I both commented on uh, the amount of Trump bumper stickers driving that same route. So that's my anecdotal. And I do pay attention. Um, Again, I think Biden has to be careful. I think his, uh, and, and you could see that they're being careful because the, the vice presidential uh, pick that he makes is going to be very important because nobody believes that he's going to serve out a full term anyway. I mean, if you look at him, I'm sorry. And this is going to be a much tougher election. You know, the shit is going to be flying. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and Biden has... He has as much baggage as if he was going on the Titanic uh, for a you know, one-year stay. In a, you know, he's got a lot of baggage. There's a lot out there to pick at. And, you know, and we know how nasty it gets. So, uh, and, and we've spent four years learning about all Trump's uh, flaws. So you're, it's kind of hard to introduce new things. What are you going to do? Introduce Russia again? People are tired of that. You're going to have to, Ukraine, they blew their wad on that. The, you know, so... This election, I think, is going to be closer than most people are, are, are suggesting. But, and the market really doesn't know what to do with it. Regardless, it's looking at massive fiscal stimulus, okay? I think that's what the market's responding to. And right now, it likes the weaker dollar, as I've maintained for a long time. Yes, it does. It, it likes the weaker dollar, and and it's just it's very interesting to see. <clears throat> very interesting for me to see uh, silver and and gold spike to to well um, all time highs for gold and, and highs not seen since 2011 in silver. Right during the time that the dollar is getting its ass handed to it. Well, I think that's what would prompt the last leg of the gold. By the way, yeah, I said that if the dollar would go down, we'd probably make new highs in the all-time highs in the gold. Um, and it's interesting to read all the commentary now of people who are bearish and why they're bearish. Oh, China, this is nonsense. It, that's really, if there's anything that 
everybody in these rooms take away from me. The, new, the media is nonsense. The dollar was going down well before. It's dropped almost 10% since the May 24th pivot by Schweibel. Yep. Uh, the yen is now, and now people are saying, well, the yen's gone long, far enough. And then, no, the yen still may be a better value than all of them when it comes to effective real yields. And some people are starting to write about that, so I give them some, uh, some credit for that, because I think that's, that's absolutely right. And I really believe that the dollar, until the yen really, you know, started to go down, dollar yen started to go down here, that the rally was going to be questionable. And I think that's absolutely proven right, because we've gotten a three rally in the uh, euro as soon as the yen really definitively started to, uh, to gain in strength. So now you've got just a good old dollar sell off and you see it in the dollar index, but the dollar index is still way too heavily weighted in the euro for me, for my sense. But regardless, that's what you have and that's where it is. So we're also seeing it reflected in the Bloomberg index. Well, the yes. Bloomberg commodity index. You are, yeah. As the dollar goes down, commodity, look at it. it's you know done very nicely. Um, does it have sustain? Uh, we'll see. Don't know yet. Uh, you know, we've been we're, we're still down considerably on the year in that, even though the dollar is uh, now much now weaker on the year. Let's just take a look. Uh, yeah. Let's see, on December 30, well, the Bloomberg index was up at 81.36. You know, we're trading 68.42. So we're still down uh, quite a bit in, in that term. So if, the, and there is a correlation there. It, it takes a while. It takes a while for all you algo heads. Uh, not everything happens in uh, three, three nanoseconds. Um, takes a while for the market to set up. And to it does. Through. It does. You know, and, and there was articles today about the debt structure again. Uh, I think it was a Wall Street Journal ran one about the, the heavy load on African countries. If somebody's got that, pull it up and share it. Uh, and I, you know, some people sent it to me and said, wow, this is a great article. I said, it's, it's, it's an interesting article. But, you know, a lot of this debt to the develop, developing world is a fallout from the Bernanke Fed and the policies because yeah. people chase idiocy looking for yield when they're starved for yield. They're willing to eat certain things that um, make absolutely no sense. And then they, they'll come crying when they have to take a, a haircut or some type of hit or ask for forbearance. But I raised this issue, and I raised it to these guys. There was a group who sent, sent me the article this morning, and uh, I said, it's an okay article, but here's what the article misses, because they're all asking for IMF bailouts. Now, last, let, let me, so my attitude is, hey, if the IMF is going to get involved in this, it's time for them to sell some gold. Uh. We're up at night. We're making all-time highs. You're looking for money to help bail out. So if everybody's going to eat here, meaning the IMF is going to take some losses, the private equity groups are going to take some losses, some sovereign wealth funds are going to take some losses, but you better damn well sell some gold. What are you sitting on it for? You're telling me, you know, you, all the great economists who work, and, are ever, and it is a make work program for the economists. Sorry for all my economic friends who take umbrage when I bash the IMF, but it is. Uh, um, they, they're all haters of gold. Why are you sitting on gold? I know Article 4 of the IMF, I think it's Article 4, which talks about, you know, when the members uh, contributed gold into the IMF reserves because that was part of the funding mechanism. But they're sitting on, okay, I'm going to ask a question to this group. How much money, what is the present value of the IMF gold hoard? I couldn't even imagine. I have no idea. Come on. This is an educated group. Who's got that? Come on. Somebody's got to have it. 
the moronic trader from Chicago. See, Regis, Regis, Phil, Regis Philbin is dead. Maybe you should call him and get the answer. Regis died? Oh, yeah, Regis. See, how, see how far behind this weekend. I am? Yeah, and I like Regis, but you know, you might want to use your, one of your lifelines. Anybody come up with an answer? Take a wild guess. Come on. What kind of cowards are you? Give me 20 seconds. I'm going to... Uh, All right, go ahead. You. Go ahead. I'm, see I'm just going to going to not check Google quickly. Go yeah, ahead. No, I'm, gonna, I'm doing the math. I'm not checking Google either. It'll, it'll shock you. 100 billion. No, not a chance. It's more than that. Much more. 4.5. It's, it's probably, I guess, it's gotta be in the up, trillions. Up, no, it's probably up to about 350 billion at current market prices. Holy I believe, cow. I believe I could be off a little, but not much. All right, so 25% of their uh, of um, uh, 25 percent of their holdings have to be in gold, isn't that right? Something like that. Well, yeah, and but they have to get the okay to sell it, you know, because again, it's not absolutely, actually, it's their gold, but it's not their gold, okay? So who, who from, Ira? I was just going to ask that. Is it, the, is it the members of the IM, is it the, the, uh, the members of the SDRs, or is it the members of the, uh, the, 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 the is it the, F, is it the, 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 uh, uh, the countries that are holding currencies that are in the, the SDR basket, or is it the, just the members of the IMF? Very good question. And it's the, I think it's the original members. So it wouldn't, so yes, it, well, the SDRs are, you know, whose ever currencies are in there, but yeah. no, it's bigger than that, I believe. But Matt, that's a very good point because you, last week, actually, what's the date today? The 27th. 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 On, on July 16th, <laughs> opinion piece in the FT which I found interesting, that got zero discussion outside of Ira Harris. Uh, and it was written by Yi Gang. And Yi Gang is the governor of the People's Bank of China. The title of the article, the IMF should turn to special drawing rates, rights in its COVID-19 response. Now, uh, so, you know, he, I found it interesting that he was the source of this. And I'll, I'll quote from, he says, the IMF in any case has the capacity to lend only about a trillion dollars, about half of the two trillion in extra funding, it is estimated, may be required in a worst case scenario. But the fact that China is pushing this, of course, it's in their best interest, by the way. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Because... That's that would make the, the yuan a more uh, representative currency on the in, in global reserves because the SDR yes. is really only a basket of the underlying fiat currencies. With China having been uh, admitted into the basket in what, September of, of 18, was it? Yeah, yeah, maybe or seven, it was recently. Yeah. It was during the Trump years. Boy, that's so, I interesting. Find, so I find that article fascinating. And yet, nobody talked about it, but I said, well, this isn't good for the dollar. And you could, you know, there's no way because the Chinese are telling you. And more importantly, if the IMF sells gold, let's see who steps up to buy it. Is, is that information available? It is available. And, I, and I'm glad... That sounded like Michael, right? Who was it? No, that's uh, no, Jack. Uh, Jack. Jack. Okay. Oh, Jack. Oh, or hold on. So now let me go to this article that Bosco, who I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's been a blog reader for a long time. And he runs a, he actually took a, a business out of what I proposed in like 2012, 13, and 14. And he's up in Canada and it's called Golden Motion, in which he stores people's gold. And, he sell, and there's bonds back that, so you can earn some interest by pledging your gold, and then it's, it gets utilized. Uh, hold on one second. Let me find this. 
So there is an article, okay? I, and I read it, and I know Bosco sent it to me, so let me. Uh, yes, it's right. It's called, the article is entitled, uh, it's from um, a group I don't really know, uh, uh, Voima, V-O-I-M-A, Gold. They have a, it's, they have a, it's a dot com, so they have a website, and they have a piece entitled In Insight, Europe has been preparing a gold, a global gold standard since the 1970s. Okay. okay. It's worth it. It's worth a read. It's, it's, it's not a short read, but it's very readable. Here, let's see if I can send it to you, Matt. Let me see. Let me see. That sounds uh, uh, like another conspiracy theory turned into conspiracy fact. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I read the article because, and this was my response to uh, Yi Gang's uh, piece. Because, let's see, did it, did that make it to you? I just sent it to you, I think. Well, hold on. Hold on. Golly, that would, what, what would that mean for the Bretton Woods Agreement? What would that mean? Well, Bretton Woods doesn't matter. It's, it's over anyway. But it, there's a, a famous piece that I have cited several times in the blog over the years. On a discussion between Henry Kissinger and Under Secretary of State Thomas Enders, back in 1974. And this article cites that. So I found it, that really caught my, uh, hold on, what did I do with it? Did, Matt, did you get something here? Let's see. See if you got something for me. Yes, I got it. Okay, all right, so that's the link. So it's, it's a very interesting piece because you read, you know, Again, I, I think people are naive. And again, with what I do and the way I read and my, you know, I've been doing this for so long and aggregating uh, knowledge and information about this. There's, you have to look at things in context. When you start to take them totally out of context, they lose, you know, it may fit somebody's narrative but it's built on false, uh, it creates false outcomes because you're not looking at it in, in, a, in, a, in a wider point. It's like, the, I, I couldn't really, I started reading all the stories today about the dollar and I, I just started laughing because it was because of this, it was because of that, it was because of, you know, COVID's not going away. <laughs> COVID's not going away. Yes, you're over 4 million in the US cases, of course, and I actually, now it's hitting home because I have a, uh, a great nephew down in uh, Chapel Hill who came down, he lives in a house with, uh, he's a student, 20 years old and dumber than a rock. Smart, smart as a whip and dumber than a rock, but they live and they all have COVID. Oh. So, uh, yeah, the cases are proliferating, but on the other hand, and I thought the market would take some positive outcome from this, the morbidity rate has dropped dramatically. You know that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. 5%, almost down to about 1.7, 1.6. That's because so many younger people are coming down with it. I think that, but Ira, I think that the market is seeing that as a positive, which is why we're not trading, in, why the S&P is not trading in a 29 or 30 handle. Good. That's, a, that's a good study. point. You're right. You're right. They don't say it, but they do, they do see it. I saw a lot of volume. It's interesting. The, 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 last, the last couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of sell volume um, coming in, but, but it's all been absorbed. So at first I thought, oh, here we go. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pop out of this. Uh, we're going to break out of this range to the downside. But then it maybe it just kind of it, it, it dawned on me that maybe this is just insiders that bought all that shit selling it. And then I read the article on Bloomberg um, about that exact thing. It's the insiders yeah. that got that that got long down at the bottom are now starting to to just quietly average their way out of their their, their longs. And hey, I'd be surprised you know, to see that happen. There's a lot of money been made. You know what? Yeah. You know me. I'm a doubles hitter. Listen, I'm not catching this last leg on the gold. 
I, I moved over to platinum and of course it has not been as dynamic. And now I'm out of all the metals just because, you know, it is, it's yeah. been a very nice run, but, but the currencies, as you know, this room as well as I, because I've been very adamant about my views on the currency. This has been a nice, uh, nice, um, a nice trade with, as I would say, some wind in its sails. So, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm trading accordingly. So I'm much more oriented to the to the currencies right now. But I can't I, wait. I can't wait to read this Voima article. Um, oh, it's good. I really can't. And also, there's also been some talk about about a gold back um, or an asset back, maybe a gold back, but asset back to think generally uh, uh, of a um, uh, you know digital currency. Yes, of course. The Russians have been right. This, I've made think that the Russians and Chinese have wanted this. If you see a real digital currency, um, and, and a nice move today in Bitcoin, it took a while. Yeah. I actually was pricing it. I almost bought some last week uh, down at 9600 but you know what I said? Ah, there's so many other things going on. If I lose money, then I'm going to be aggravated with myself. <laughs> well, you know, I do that at times where you'll switch over and go, what the fuck did I do that for? It's like... <laughs> I feel that way about the plan. I'm out of the platinum and I'm really out good today, but, and it's been a nice fight, but I've left uh, other things because, you know, I made the switch. Um, the European debt markets trade, at least there's a trade there. The U.S. debt markets are just pathetic. That's another thing I, I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit. Was... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. And, um, but the, at least there's movement because What's going on in the European debt markets is that people figured out they can synthetically create a euro bond by building baskets across the um, the entire thing. And you can actually generate a higher yield on uh, European 10 years. And There's a news story out, I guess, uh, unemployment benefit to the Republicans in the White House want to m move it from 600 to 200. Not a, not a good thing, by the way. Not for election purposes, but. Uh, hold on one second. Just another Band-Aid. Uh, yeah, so, you know, you, you do have all these things in play. Uh, uh, um, and just be careful with what you can see. You know, so they'll call somebody until they get a Y, which is, oh, Chinese, uh, U.S. friction. Oh, Europe, Europe, better. Oh, you know what? But, Read and have and have the contextual. Uh, we're not the first day. We're certainly not always right, but when we, we get right, you get some really good moves. Well, and that's it, it, we get some really good moves. And if we're, we're not right, well, we can manage our positions and we get out you know, quick, rather quickly. And so when we get the good ones at work, we go. Exactly. Exactly. I and I and I was. I was wrong. You're breaking up just a little bit. Times before I got this right, but okay, yeah, I'm having good. I, I'm I'm having some uh, because I'm on the I'm on the hotel. I I could plug in my, but I'm not. So I'm not. Uh, no, that's good. Uh, you're, you're good there. You're, okay. You're yeah, I could see it's back up. I was getting a late and see. Uh, so I mean, we but we want to be, really be attentive to this because. There are a lot of things in the air. Now, now I'm looking, now I get into the position where I'm starting to look for corrections. Cause you know, as we, as all good traders know, trees don't grow to the sky. No, me too. And I'm looking for one too, which doesn't mean that we don't, that doesn't mean that the S and P doesn't travel back up to you know, try to fill that gap from late February either before we, we, we do turn around and, and, and correct, or it doesn't, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen this afternoon. 
Listen, but the great thing about it, really, and I hope it does, because these corrections are powerful. But this all flies in the face of the standard narrative that they give you, right? Gold right. can't go up. I, I heard it on NBC for months and months and months. There's no inflation. And then yeah. when there's still, there's still no inflation and gold keeps rallying, oh, the dollar's gone up. But the, it was going up well before the dollar was going. So, yes, it was. you know, it, so that's why, that's why I work as hard as I do, because I don't accept standard narratives. And if you, and I think, you know, this room and other rooms have benefited because if you don't accept the standard narratives and you're willing to, to work harder and go farther, you will find some interesting things. Work harder, go farther. Oh, that's a great line. And, and that's what we're uh, uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And and we're going to be wrong, you know. Again, but we don't add to our losers. We don't build on losers. We take our losses and go, hmm, you know, and, and re reassess and reevaluate, and maybe look for another uh, area to uh, to move to where there's you know greater opportunities and you know what. Why am I going to beat a dead horse? It, it, it's just not, you know, lots of things in markets, and I'll always remind people, is timing. Because if I'm early, I'm wrong. It's, well, all right, and that was making, that, that was exactly what was popping into my mind. So obviously when we're early, you know, we're, we can be right that trade, but if we're early, we're, we're still wrong. Um, and we wait for the next setup. We wait for the market. Sometimes, as, as we said earlier, you know, it's going to take a little bit of time for the market to set up. So we can be in a little bit early, take our, cut our losses, but wait for that market to take that setup. And, and as we find the setup, whether it's, in, whether it's in treasuries or it's in equities or it's in, in the names or, or, you know, or in metals, we take that next setup. And then, then we'll, we'll catch it. We manage our trades. We manage our positions correctly things become a lot easier and again we work harder to go farther god what a great line you know it's it, it's just the way that, you know what and again it not every trade is a winner no most good traders will tell you at least seven out of ten are losers now, i know people don't like to hear that but that just represents uh your ability to manage your money You know, when I hear these stories on, about Robin Hood and this, and that's because that's not what they teach them. That really, that really kind of, that whole thing saddens me. Yeah, yeah, there's some people who really gotten hurt. <laughs> really does, it saddens me. And, and um, yeah, people are getting hurt, but it, it's, it's not, it's the dream, you know? It's the dream and it's the, people get hurt financially all the time. You know, we're, 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 we're Americans. We can, we can battle back, you know, we're, we're going to keep plugging ahead. I, I guess it's the broken, the broken hearts, you know, it's the broken lives that it leaves in its wake. Yeah. It's the, you know, because then it makes it a little bit harder or a lot, it makes it a lot more difficult to get back up and to continue to trudge forward and continue to make it yeah, find to find that next trader, to find the truth, or to find the ability to be able to manage your capital while you're learning how to do it. I, this whole thing is just very dangerous because I think it's leaving a lot of broken hearts. We've got uh, unemployment running out for millions of people this month, right? You know, at the end of this month, and yep. and and what's going to happen going into August? We've already seen report after report all weekend long uh, of of um, food lines being miles long, people running out of food, yeah. the, the, the banks running out of food by the time the people at the end of the line get up. Yeah, I'm gonna tell you what, if I was blogging right now, I'd be putting out a call for, you know, again, you know, I, I use St. Vincent de Paul as my place to feed the uh, hungry and clothe, clothe the naked. But, you know, we did pretty well with that. We raised almost forty five, forty six thousand dollars $46,000. And as, you know, my dear friend Mike told me, he says, you have no idea how much food that is on a wholesale basis. And I was proud of it because, you know, it's just a small part. Uh, and uh, if, I, I might come back on and start walking again soon. Um, uh, talk with, uh, 
this, but I'm trying to build out this web, you know. Web. How's a new website coming along? Yeah, it's, I know who that is. Thanks, Jack. Um, <laughs> uh, I, w I, w I will really get in touch with you. I'm just not far enough along yet. I've, I've actually paid for it for a year. And when I saw on a, uh, how they posted all the blogs from day one, I was pretty impressed by that. The archive, yep. much yeah. easier to access, much easier to navigate than, uh, well, WordPress is a bit, it just takes, it's a little cumbersome for me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an old person, but we'll have everything else there. And I'm still, uh, still waiting to do that uh, Bernard podcast. It's coming up, I know. Uh, but he was too exhausted last week. And I'm sorry about the mic, uh, the microphone and uh, the one I did with Rick Reed, with Rick Rule, because that, that was, was pretty damn good. Great I still have pages of notes and I want to ask about that. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to give you 15 more minutes. Uh, there's too many things going on. All right, so what can we talk? What about the um, uh, uh, the the historical um, uh, deal? <laughs> The European Recovery Fund, the historical deal that seems to leave out so many hurting, actually hurting countries. Um, Am Ambrose Evans Pritch Pritchard, that that the article that you had sent out, that that really kind of upset me. You know, it, more band aids for people that don't need the band aids, while the while countries that are bleeding out or possibly going to bleed out that need a real tourniquet. Just kind of being left to drift in the wind again. No, I see, I, and I dis I disagree with Ambrose on that. I and you know I have a lot of, but that's why we we write and we uh, discuss things. I did, because the whole from Lagarde's point of view, she needed to get that euro bond, and that size it now elevates it into a credible investable instrument, a euro bond. Okay. Now, as the crisis continues, or the economic um, stress continues, then there will be to, to just to roll all that ECB balance sheet into that euro bond. That me is logically the next step of what she's really going for, but in her wisdom, you don't, you don't go for the whole enchilada. Everybody always wants to, you know, it's like the Fed, you know, you go big or, or go home. You can't go that big because you're, you are now going to the next step, which they should have gone to under Draghi's, whatever it takes, but they couldn't because, you know, you had the frugal, uh, the frugal, you didn't need the frugal four, you had the frugal one and that was Germany and they said no. They were not ready at that time. And all you do is have to look at the negotiations of, uh, that went on. And first of all, it was all done. And my, I know Michael's on uh, to bail out the big banks who were stuck with all that debt anyway. That's what was the outcome. And every, you know, just follow it through. The uh, German banks were loaded up with Greek debt and Spanish debt. And, it, and they still, you know, to a certain extent are, why? Because sovereign debt carries a zero risk weighting under Basel II and probably Basel III. So they don't have to, there's no reserve. So you, you get much more for your money. And if there's zero risk, you're not worried about a default because that's what zero risk tells you. You know, all sovereign debt's the same. Of course, we know that it's not because it's not priced the same, but under the bank regs, that's the way it's treated. So that's what they own. So would I rather buy a German Bund if I'm a bank for negative 50 basis points or would I rather own an Italian bond at you know 2.6%? They're all in euros, there's no currency. It's not like the old days where I'd be in Lira, so I'd run Lira risk, but I'm not running currency risk. No. And I don't have to, I don't have to um, uh, reserve more money for what is deemed to be a higher, uh, greater risk vehicle. I don't have to. So kind of no brainer, especially once you lose 
or once you diminish the existential risk. So this is going to be a long time playing out. And I don't, I'm not in agreement with Ambrose on this one because I, I'm looking at the end game. Now, it's why I'm excited to do this podcast with Bernard because now that Bernard has a new book coming out, uh, although I heard it's been delayed six months, which is why he's been uh, fatigued. But if uh, I, I want to hear, where, I want to hear where he where he stands on it. Right now, I, I'm not in that. I'm not. In the, I know Ambrose, and I and I appreciate Ambrose writing about it because it's an important part of the discussion. You must look at it to that extent. You must, but. I, I got to see more, as they say. I, I want to see a lot more of this. I, I think I, I see exactly what you mean, and it's it was so simple. It's right in front of our eyes. The you know, <laughs> it's all denominated in euros. Why would I want to? Why would I want to buy a, a French ten-year when I can go ahead and and and, and buy Italian debt? You know, <laughs> yeah. It's just I didn't think of it that way, and it's just so simple. It's a, it's a legitimate question, but, but you have to remove the existential risk. As I say, I believe that last Tuesday it dropped from uh, 10% to 10%. That's how significant I thought that meeting was. And the fact that Merkel was not allowing anybody to leave until, you know, until they reached a agreement. So everything gave a little, and the Germans basically stepped up and said, yeah, we, we understand. And so, and so what happened, they, they the, uh, the rebates. It, it's interesting, everybody bashed Britain on Brexit, but everything that took place from the Austrians, the Dutch, the Swedes in the days was basically the British argument. So, it, and a lot, of, and, the, and they were decrying the fact that usually they let Brit, Britain take the heat for this, they had to take the heat. And they said it very openly. Because it would usually be a British, a uh, British stance, and for the British people, they just saved themselves a boatload of fucking money. I have to tell you, sorry, sorry for my language, but now that they don't have to partake in the guarantee of all this, it's a huge saving. What they tend to do with it will be what the market, you know, tells us. But hell, the dollar is trading so weak, even the British pound gets uh, some love. Yes, it does. You're long the pound, Jack, aren't you? Uh, I'm short uh, dollar Swiss. Sure. Well, you were very happy this morning. That was kind of weird, wasn't it? But, mm. but do we have to wonder who was in this morning? <laughs> yes, the S and P, without question. But I will tell you something, Jack. I, I, I'm a little upset myself because there was an article that came out last week in the FT where UBS made some comments that they Switzerland to be named the currency manipulator by the U.S. Treasury. I don't know if you saw that. No. Well, I think it came out on Wednesday. In fact, I just deleted it from my junk, from my uh, trash bin because I thought I was so, done with the article. Oh, wait a minute. FT, you say? Wait a minute. Yeah, I was, I, wait, I actually printed it out. So let's see if I brought it with me. Let's see if I brought it with me. I love that you print out the articles you read. Well, I'm some of them. That. I have to make some notes on them. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. But UBS said that they believed that that was going to be the case. Let me see if I have it. Come on. Nope, I don't have it. If I was in Chicago, I'd have it. I know I left it on my desk. But they claimed that that was going to be the case. So uh, I was in talking with some other people. I said, well, we should probably, we should probably like the Swiss more now than anything. And, you know, actually last week, the Swiss from Wednesday on was really the, the strongest performer, which kind of weird, uh, but it did. Now this morning, without question, Swiss bank was in. Let's see, let's see what the, uh, 
The Swiss interest rates really didn't move. Uh, so that was, and then this, you know, because this morning uh, was absolutely the opposite. The Swiss was actually lower at one time with the uh, euro up over, you know, almost a percent. So mm -hmm. that was definitely, uh, but now the Swiss has, you know, regained some of its footing. And that would fly in the face of, of um, the, the normative narrative because if the gold is up because of its haven, uh, uh, if it's up, then how can you justify the Swiss franc being weaker, right? And because they're both havens. So the Swiss were definitely in this morning uh, doing what Ever that is they like to do as far as uh, <laughs> doing whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, yeah. and, you know, and at any time they can certainly, you know, if they've got 10 or 15 billion Swiss to, to sell, to keep, you know, but, but re really they shouldn't be intervening here because the Euro Swiss is holding up very nicely. You know, it's at 108. In fact, uh, hold on, let me run. I'm just looking, I'm running some interest rate work here. Hold on one second. Yeah, 10817 I've got. Yeah, you got you got the Bund trading at negative 50. Where's the French? Actually, the Bund, the Bund's the strongest debt instrument today. That's kind of interesting. And uh, uh, so we're back at 30 basis point differential between the French and the German 10-year. The Italian 10-year is at 98 basis points. Greece is at 106. So again, uh, Portugal's at 33, Spain's at 30. These are, I'm giving positive, not negative. So you can build a portfolio uh, or you can build a synthetic Euro bond and wait it and, and still come out with a positive. And I think you're starting to see that. I mean, the Bund is negative 50, but the Bund will always be stronger. Well, I won't say always, but for the more than medium term, because number one, they, they existed, on, they lived under Schwarz now and Michael can explain it far better than I can, but the black zero, which was they've run a balanced budget or, or surplus over the last five, six years, because that was the law. And now it's being under the pandemic, things are getting, uh, are becoming much more flexible. But there's, there is a shortage of German debt. And then of course the European Central Bank, the ECB owns a lot of it. And being that the Bund is the uh, highest form of uh, sovereign collateral in Europe that puts another natural bid into it. The same with, you, with U.S. Uh, debt, because uh, it's needed for repo and therefore collateral in the financing world. There's always a premium built into U.S. debt instruments. Even when they're getting whacked, it's still a premium because people need it for repo operations. So, Ari, just, just for the last few minutes, uh, I'm just wondering, what happens if the U.S. Um, names the Swiss as currency manipulators? You, what happens should, in that in that scenario? You should make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, well, I mean, that's what I would imagine. The Swiss will probably push back, but there'd be some pressure on them. But let's take a look at something here, okay? I, and I think this is a very important element of that. This is. This is it, at the SMB says even if a conflict with the U.S. can be avoided, uh, meeting all three formal criteria is likely to lead to in increased uncertainty about the SMB's future monetary policy, and is likely to increase uh, on Bloomberg. Bloomberg. You're reading that on well, who wrote that on Bloomberg? Uh, Catherine Bosley, July twenty okay. second. Okay, now this I have in my hand right now, printed out. And this was the speech from Thomas Jordan on July 14th. And Thomas Jordan is the uh, chairman of the uh, SNB. And it's a speech, small country, big challenge in Switzerland's monetary policy response to the coronavirus pandemic. And he talks about why the Swiss are doing what the Swiss, and throughout it, he talks about uh, negative interest rates were introduced because of its effect on demand for credit, not, oh, I'm sorry, n not because of its effect, uh, but because of the influence on the exchange rate. 
he has eight mentions in this five page speech and it's not long it's you can read it in five minutes where he talks about the impact on the currency for this so you know when i read this i i, I have a note on it when i read this jerome powell are you listening because this is all mm -hmm. about currency intervention mm -hmm. to affect foreign exchange rates so i thought we weren't supposed to be doing this yeah, and then he says, he says, uh, our experience shows that foreign exchange market interventions and the negative interest rates are essential for a small open economy with a safe haven currency in a global low interest rate environment. And I, in my smarmy way, made a note, how many are there? If there's only one I can think of. <laughs> Who is he talking about? And then... In his conclusion, he says negative interest and foreign exchange market interventions have served us well. So, I mean, it's pretty easy if you know you don't have to look far if you want to see what their real uh, intention is. He, said, he lays it out there. Yeah, I would think that the Swiss should rally, but as you see today, you know this the Swiss may want to take on the U.S. You know, straight head on and go, you know, we're not, this is our monetary policy. How is it any different than yours? So I will say this, it would get very interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I'll have to look into this, but when, when was the last time that the U.S. named a country as a currency manipulator and what yeah. happened? They dance around it. I wouldn't make too big a thing of it because, you know, honestly, the Swiss will thumb their nose at it. But they might let mm. the currency go a little bit. But they're much more concerned about the Euro Swiss. And that's why. Uh, and I'll tell you what, they're also concerned about the yen Swiss because Japanese and Swiss companies compete in a lot of different uh, direct industries in optics, in laser we're, there are areas where they're really so. If the Swiss g gains too much strength against the yen, they worry about some of their you know high advanced tech industries. And I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm not talking about that tech. I'm talking about optics and lasers and mm -hmm. things of that nature where the Swiss are really good at. And um, and this is the uh, SMB are concerned about these. Uh, well, they would they would get some uh, pushback from you know from the government. Yeah, they're, they're in it together. That's why you name the government. But uh, I would keep my eye on the Euro Swiss and Euro Swiss. Look at you know the Swiss really shouldn't be too concerned, and, and they have some latitude here because we're basically we're basically unchanged on the year with all the shit that's happened. The Euro Swiss is now virtually unchanged on the year. Pull it up quickly. But let's see what the Euro Swiss, let's see what the Yen Swiss is doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see what the Yen, and I'm looking at cash markets, by the way. So yeah. Just, yeah. As am I. Yeah. Everybody's with me here. So I'm going to look at this uh, Swiss Yen. Okay. So it closed out uh, December. One twelve. We're one fourteen forty one. You know, so you've had about a two percent move. The only way they have long dollars because they have a tendency to intervene when they need to let uh, Japanese corporates out of a bad position. But but everybody's kind of nervous about having the finger pointed at them. By the way, so I'm I'm not really yeah. looking for much. Um, you don't, you don't want to be that person right now. You don't want to be that entity. But, the, you know, Swiss yen is interesting, but Euro Swiss is basically unchanged. So there's really not a whole lot. And I was surprised by the, by the diversification, but the Swiss really had a good week last week. That's the, Sw the Swiss currency. Ah, oh, let me just go to the dollar 
Swiss. Well, I'm going to do it in futures. Sorry. Uh, let me just look at it last week. So. Seventeenth and closed at one hundred six. So last week the Swiss, the Swiss had almost a two hundred point in IMM terms move, which was every bit as much I think with the euro, but uh, much more than the yen. So I, I'll bet that's why they were in. You know, they don't tell us when they come in selling selling Swiss francs, which is what they do, and they evidently were doing it this morning uh, against which currencies they were most involved with. So always worth watching. I applaud you. You must have had a very good week last week, Jack. Um, Not bad. Okay, good. <laughs> you <made us> all. <laughs> Send me a good bottle of Irish whiskeys. So we'll toast together. Yeah. It sounds like uh, a plan. Uh, but that's where it lies. So, but again, the Swiss just doesn't exist in a vacuum. You have to do its measures across the board. Yeah. And I must say, I need to do a, a better job of being more more aware and more you know i i am massively focused on on price and and trading out of out of their respective opening ranges i need i need to do more research i need yeah, to we know all more do. We, yeah. we all do but but that's what makes us a, a job and not a hobby yeah Absolutely. We we all do. We we all do. Normal yeah, human beings all do. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen I've seen your metrics from the from the, the, the FT the last two years running. I don't know how a human being can do more work than you do. <laughs> yeah. You know what? See, that's and you should know better growing up where you grew up. It's amazing what you can get done when you want to get done. Absol mm -hmm. Absolutely, for right? sure. Absolutely. Right? I, I could play playground basketball for four hours, go to work for five hours, get all my studying done, uh, and still have time to, to make out on the playground. It, amazing what you could get done back in those days. Absolutely. And still can't. You see, you still can. It's it's a matter of what you do with your time. You know, I my wife and I always laugh about. It. I go, God, I think about when we were kids. My literally, my mother would open up the door at eight in the morning and get the hell out of here. You know, <laughs> don't come back till dinner. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. You know, playground. They didn't want. They didn't want to know. I was the fourth boy in line. They, they didn't want to know where I was going to believe me there were there were so many eyes in the name at the time i got home if i had something i should not have done my mom was waiting at the door she already knew about it oh we got beatings <laughs> mrs carrie mrs carrie mrs donahue mrs pender mrs reardon would crack us up and down the street and we go home and get a beating from our parents for getting a beating from mrs reardon <laughs> There was, we had mothers on every block. We used to play ball in the alley, which you And there was a woman, we called her Groucho, because of the ball, pretty good at jumping fences, but she was just an irritant. She was an irritant. So when, it, <laughs> when the snow would fall, I'd be walking through the alley, and there's no question I was trying to break a few windows with snowballs. By the time I... I got home. My mother, why are you starting with her? Ma, she's, she's a vicious old lady. Why are you starting? Actually, one of the neighbor, a guy who was about 10 years older than me, she got in his face over something and he pushed her and she fell down and broke a hip. That was not, that was not good because he got arrested. That was, that was for assault and battery. That was bad. But she was an irritant. But yeah, she, we, my we mother's, they didn't have speed dial, but my mother knew her. Didn't matter. They, they knew everything. And all the teachers lived in the neighborhood. That was the worst part. Because by the time you got to school, you after can, the weekend. can't get away with anything. Nothing. Our yeah. teachers lived in the neighborhood too, but they were all in a convent together. Oh, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's you. 
That's a different problem for you. I, I came home uh, from Ford City Mall with my friend Eddie Carey, whose who's, uh, uh, aunt, Eileen Carey, was the head of streets and sanitation, and whose uncle, Jeremiah Joyce, robbed the city blind. Oh, yeah. Now we're yeah. So Eddie and I came home with an earring from uh, 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 Ford City. Hey, look, we got our ears pierced. Mrs. Carey, who was from Ireland, saw it and ripped them. She, I still have a little, little line in my ear. Ripped them right out of her ears. <laughs> I went home, you know, like with full of indignation, righteous. My, I, my, I was convinced my parents were going to go and, and yell at Mrs. Carey for causing me such pain and anguish. And my father said, oh, you're lucky. You're lucky I, you didn't come home to me. I had ripped it out of your ear and ripped your ear off. Oh, hell, hell. Trust me. I, I, I know those days and going to school and being an athlete. And you, you really had to, you know, I took a beating from the coaches. Oh, yeah. And that was expected, though. I, I'm telling you, I was when I first wore my fair blue, uh, bell bottoms. I'm walking down the hall, and a football coach from down the hall yells, "Hey, Harris, if you fart, you're gonna blow your shoes off." <laughs> I still, I still carry that embarrassment. <laughs> that's that's a great story. Hey, uh, is does Sturch's is Sturch running his? Uh, uh, is Sturch running the uh, um, uh, his charity year round? Yes, now okay. more than ever. Now more, right. you know, the needs are so great. They're, right. they're just great. And that's why I did that because I had talked to Mike. I said, "What can I do?" He says, "Well, he says you can't believe how." And I he didn't ask me. I asked him. So that's when, why we did that. So I'm always. All right, we're going to keep making sure that we we're, we're, that we raise money for them. All right. We're, 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 is there any more we want to get into? I know we're boring everybody. I wanted to get into – well, we can always talk later on in the week after MOC uh, – yeah. uh, MOC, FOMC. Oh, yeah, you know what? I'm not looking for anything from there. They're okay. Hold, they're going to hold their course because – and, and here's what Bernanke's uh, – Bernanke, here's what Powell's going to keep speaking to. There's just too much uncertainty. There's too much uncertainty. I want to hear whether he uses that line again, you know, which I have a lot of problems with through no fault of their own, because again, it's not the place for the bank. And as other people want to hear him be asked about gold, in fact, uh, B Peter Bookvar in his piece this morning showed uh, the one and a half minute clip. You can go find it on YouTube of Ron Paul asking Bernanke about gold in 2011, you know, and I've taken Bernanke to task because he, you know, not in that, he does, but the piece that Bookfire cited didn't have it in there um, where Bernanke famously says, well, I understand Bitcoin, but I, I, I don't understand gold, which uh, is an amazing comment. But Ron Paul's question to Bernanke, it's 2011 in a congressional hearing. Uh, you should go look, it's on YouTube find it and watch it. So I'm, I'm going to be interested to see whether any journalists ask any questions. Uh, does he look at gold? Here's, here's the way the question will be phrased. Um, maybe it'll come from Steve Leisman. Uh, does the rise in gold have any implications on future inflation? And does that concern you? That's probably how the question will be phrased. And uh, be interesting to see how he answers it. I'd like to see somebody raise a question if uh, does the rise in gold um, along with China, Russia, and now possibly the EU talking about a gold-backed currency pushed with the weakness in the dollar, does that mean that the, 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 the years of dollar um, uh, hegemony is over and we are looking at a gold-backed USD in some way, whether it's okay. domestic or international? And, and I'll give you his answer. He'll say, well, that's an interesting, but that's not my bailiwick for the Secretary of Treasury to discuss the dollars, so I really have no comment. That, that'll be his answer. That one I'll guarantee. Um, but those are the kind of questions I'd be looking for, but they, they'll do nothing and say, you know, we're going to hold here. We're, there's just too much uncertainty. Uh, especially as the ride, rise in COVID cases may extend us out longer. So we're going to be patient. Uh, I'd like for somebody to ask them about the muni bond market because that's coming. Yes, that's It has important. to be coming because 
because the negative feedback loop that will develop from uh, falling uh, state and uh, county and uh, city revenues will create massive layoffs. So they're going to have to sustain the present situation. Yeah, that's the way I see the, I, there'll be no, I, nothing radical, especially it's the summer and the markets, you know, they'll talk about thin, thinning markets that are thinning out, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, I would be aware of that. Um, I, I wrote one last thing and then um, hopefully we can talk later on in the week. Will you have time later on in the week? I will be back uh, Wednesday. Yeah, Friday I should be free. Okay. Then I'll email you. How, how's Alex? Alex, her husband Alex and baby? Is, Alex is doing, she's with her mother right now and the baby. They went to Costco, which means uh, good. Uh, they're helping the economy this morning. I guarantee you. <laughs> she, she's doing well and uh, really adjusting. You know, people, you know, you know, Matt, once you start to have kids. Boy, it's a different story. The world is different. All the way around. Everything well, you know, you, everything you thought you knew, yeah. yeah. You're no longer in control. I'm getting called from them right now. Uh, you're no longer in control. You're you you go from total selfishness to selflessness. And yeah. uh, it's a learning pro we we all learn it. It's yes, a beautiful we do. scary thing. It is a scary thing, and yet they and, and yet, you know, for all these years we figured out how to do it so that there's now you know mm -hmm. eight billion people on the planet. So, you know. You're not the first one, but it, it's interesting to watch. You know, I forget, you know, how you're nervous about everything. And I, I had had that conversation with my son-in-law because he's not a youngster. He's 40 years old and Alex isn't young. You know, she's 36. So to start having your first child, you kind of had life your way for all these years. Yeah. And so, you know, I told him he was nervous ahead of time. But once you see that life come in and and then once they start crawling, you know, every, as their personality adapts to you, it becomes so fa fabulous. Listen, we did it four times, so uh, I'm either a glutton for punishment, one, but the fact that I'm still doing what I'm doing for a living, two, yeah, I'm a glutton for punishment. And, uh, <laughs> but there is a lot of, there's a lot of heartache, but there's a lot of joy, so. A lot of joy, and the joy outweighs the heartache, and the heartache is all part of life anyway. I've got, I yeah, did it five I times, and I would, I would have done it five more times if I was young enough. You know what, the, the heartache is gonna find you regardless. One thing about Jack is Jack's got a seven-year-old boy who was born um, needing a liver transplant. Jack oh. gave him uh, his liver. Wow. And uh, now the seven-year-old boy is maybe one of the most beautiful, smartest, cutest little kids. He's, he's got his little desk next to Jack. So he and I will be, you know, uh, talking over Discord and, you know, on video, looking at each other and his son's next to him with his headset on, his little desk. He's just, how, just like a minister me. How, how beautiful is that? You know what? And, and that's, that's another type of hardship and, and heartache that you get. What? Good on you for for living through that. I, I have a I have a cousin uh, Matthew who's a, a pediatric cardiologist at uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, who was the last person in the world you would ever expect to be a doctor. He's my he's the youngest grandchild of thirty. I'm from thirty two grandchildren on my, on my paternal side. Oh. So and he's the baby. <laughs> and he's like, what a human being. Oh man, anybody who deals with children in, in that regard, wow. Because if you can withstand that heartache, whew, my, you know, I, I know women who, who my wife and I have been friends with who are pediatric, pediatric oncology nurses and doctors. Wow, wow, what you see on it. Strong, strong people. Oh man, it, it, my, my day in and day out. Day in and day out. I have a friend, Mike mm -hmm. Shriver, who's, who's at the UFC hospital, who does pediatric oncology. It's just another realm to me. You know, I, I couldn't take it. I'm not built for it. I mean, I'd, I'd be breaking down. I, but they, they do it because they look at the work as, you know, and here, Jack will tell you, you know, he's a son who, that's quite a thing. And, uh, 
in modern medicine. So when we think about how bad things are, they're not necessarily quite as bad. They're just relatively bad. You know, we worry about things relatively on a relative basis that uh, my father's generation is, would have loved to have worried about. Um, but that's uh, that's great to hear. And what a, you must look over at him and go, oh, it's just, uh, you know, it truly is. It's a miracle in its own right. It's a special thing. It's it a is. a special yeah. thing. Yeah, people have that was to it. Yeah, yeah, great, great. And I'm sure he'll grow up be a smart, young, strapping young man. And hopefully um, he appreciates what he's been given. He's he too young. He, he, well, he, he's getting there. He likes to compare scars. Oh, <laughs> does he? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he has the right attitude. He has the right attitude. Hey, let me know when you, if uh, when you get when you when you get home if you want to go out golfing next week. Okay, maybe you don't have to go golfing. <laughs> All of a sudden, you I just will. Want to go. Yeah, I, I will. And uh, as I say, probably Friday because of work. Coming on. Yes, Are we done? Started. Yes. Thank you, Ira. Thank you again. You know, I'm, uh, most pissed, I'm most pissed about my wife losing the great parking spot I had on the streets of Brooklyn. God. <laughs> you know, I, I'm an old city boy, so I, I have to find good parking spots. It's like mandatory. Can you, do, can you do in Brooklyn what we used to be able to do in Bridgeport is just throw a chair out there? No, they'll kill you here. <laughs> that chair would be gone in moments. <laughs> no, they would. Are you kidding? No, I've lived in New York for two years. Not a chance. What they do here, I don't know if you remember the old Seinfeld, and it is. See, now there's a sign. So I had parked. And I, I could park there until Tuesday, 1130. But that was, I was taking Alex to the doctor at 915. But at, from 1130 to 2, you can't park there because it's street cleaning. So they literally do a dance because they come back to reclaim, but you wait in line. It's quite remarkable to see. I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I used to be a civil engineer. I used to fix uh, broken water mains in the roads and uh, working in the city, we used to have to get cars moved quite often. They'd have the car lift come in, move the car. And we were all pretty friendly. So if parking was an issue, you just call up, Jerry to come and move the car that's in your oh. spot. Well, that calls that calls some arguments. But but I, I'm going to tell you a joke, and if nobody likes off, you know it's a little. But I, it's to me one of the funniest jokes I've ever heard about. Sci, it's a science based joke. Jack, because you're a civil engineer. There you go. So there's three science. There's three engineers sitting on a park bench arguing the existence of God. And there, one guy is an electrical engineer. One guy is a chemical engineer. And the third is a civil engineer. So the electrical engineer argues for the way that the human body is, he says, who else but electrical engineer could piece this together? God must be an electrical engineer. And the chemical engineer says, well, look at the chemical balance of the human body, how it's all put together and all works. And then look even bigger, water and air. It, God has to be a chemical engineer. So the civil engineer pipes up and he, and he look at go, oh, wait. There's no way you was the unit in the middle of creation area. I'll let you ponder that for a little bit. <laughs> Nothing from you, Jack. Nothing. <laughs> I'm. I'm. I was taking a sip of my coffee. I'm trying not to to spill it all over my desk. <laughs> it's part of the. It's part of what I make. What made me laugh? Was what, nothing what nothing from England. Jokes. England was quiet. One of my favorite all-time jokes. Oh, that's wonderful. Ah, uh, Ira, thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Okay, thanks. As always. Thank you, Ira. Yeah, Just great. You.
Thank Hi. you. Bye. Hi. Uh, again, everybody, you know, every time we have a conversation with Ira, my whole life of knowing him, I cornered him at, at uh, um, uh, I think he was a bit relieved I cornered him, but at, at the premiere of Jordi Malamed's, um, I just thought of this, I don't know why. Oh, we were talking about Jordan the other day. So I cornered him, I cornered Ira at Jordan's premiere of his, of his uh, uh, movie. <laughs> we just sat and had a drink together and talked for a bit and and uh, um, I mean, it really, it, it's, we're very lucky and very blessed to have somebody like him that, not somebody like him, to have him come in and, and talk to us and, and to give us not just his perspective, but not just his perspective, but a well-rounded perspective, a well-rounded view of how to look at global macro issues and how to look at global macro uh, traits, you know, because they're there and because not only his, his line is he eats what he cooks. So by the way, we didn't, he wasn't in last week. Uh, I know that he was stretched thin with other, other commitments and I don't want to stretch him thin. I know other people are, and I don't want to be one of those people. Uh, his, his daughter, uh, Alexandra, who is a, 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 uh, um, a columnist, by the way, or a writer, a reporter for Bloomberg herself, you can go ahead and look up Alex Harris and, and, and read her stuff. What, Jack? I said she's a good one, too. Yeah, she's very good. Yeah. And read her stuff on, on Bloomberg. She'll be back soon. She said some great articles out there, but she's her father's daughter. Oh, yeah. She's her father's daughter. He's um, even kind of looks like him. Anyway, it's, it's a great privilege to be able to get they have somebody like him with such, he doesn't just give us his, that's the great part about it is he doesn't just give us his point of view. He gives us a well-rounded point of view, you know, and he expects us to, to push back and challenge just a little bit. Um, it's hard for me to do that. It's hard for me to push back with him because I respect him so much. I like listening. I like taking notes and then I like going, and I know that he wants me to do this beforehand. But because I have so much respect for him, I like taking notes and then going back and 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 looking things up. I've already got all these the the articles copied and pasted in in that we that we've spoken about, uh, including the one that Steve Furch put up. I've got them all copied and pasted in my email, in my inbox, and so I it gives me the ability to go back and, and get a, a more well-rounded approach um, so I can take a look at things from different angles. But feel free, please, if, if there's anything that you guys ever want to challenge him on or push back to just a great, just a little bit, please do. Feel free to. Um, that, you know, that pushback can also just be clarification as well. That too. Absolutely. You know, there's no reason why this has to be a, a, a one or two-sided conversation. Well, Jack and I, and Jack, nice job jumping in too. Yeah, I, I, I struggle less and less. <laughs> Same place as you. I and I, I, and Michael, I know, I know, we all, I, all of us do. But um, I'm still like a kid with the father. You know, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to challenge my father. I don't want to embarrass my dad. Yeah, but it's not, God, I would never embarrass Ira by trying to push back. That's not what I mean. But in my mind, I've got, that's, that's, my, that's my relationship with Ira because, because I've been with him for so long. I've known him so long. I've asked him so many questions for so long. I've had so many cups of coffee with him, breakfast with him, lunch with him. Um, maybe even a drink or two through the years. But well, there's, there's this kind of, you know, teacher student thing, isn't there? That's it. And and, and it can, it. it can feel it can feel disrespectful and rude, yeah. but it's not. You know, good good students ask good questions. Ask any questions. Oh, I wanted to ask him about Ray Dalio's comments on China. Shite. Well, actually, a lot of things I wanted to ask him about, but we didn't get to. I wanted to ask him a little bit more about the. Uh, um, the EU deal. Um, well, great conversation nonetheless. Um, all right, guys, I've got, um, I've got actually a busy morning. So 
I got a couple one on ones, one I'm late for, and then um, another one afterwards. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's, uh, hold on, let me just stop this one second. <laughs> 